and welcome back to the Backstage Pass here, show number two for a Monday, April the 12th. Hard to believe we uh, had a fast weekend, Jeff. It was pretty quick with all the post-Easter and then the weekend, too, at the same time, but we got through it, yeah. and uh, pleased to be back here on the show. Full week of shows coming up, including the legend tomorrow in, in music. My God, uh, Bonnie Tyler's coming on the show to talk about her new album and just a whole bunch of stuff going on in her world and uh, a lot of cool shows coming up. Over the next few weeks, including a whisperer that I kept telling Jeff today, there may be a rock sighting here in the next uh, week or two on the show here on the Backstage Pass. So, Brandon Morrell, Jeff McMahon, presented by our good friends over at uh, Tour Guitars. Check them out, tourguitars.us, and also uh, Bangtail Whiskey, bangtail.com, where you can download the Easy Liquor app and get the bottle sent directly to your uh, doorstep right there without even leaving home. Uh, pleased to welcome in our next guest. He's uh, no stranger to the show, of course. He's been on a few times, and we've done some audio stuff, and uh, – First time I think we connected video wise, but he's here. Good to have I'm you, Kent Blazy, on the show. What's up, Kent? I'm just glad to be here. Anytime I'm visiting <laughs> with you, it's fun. We well, always Jeff, have a good time. I, I don't know about Jeff, but you know, you make it fun. Uh, you, you can you can let us know at the end. <laughs> <laughs> hey, since we last talked today, what's been going on in your camp? Of course, we're going to talk a lot about authentic today and break it down, which is the latest uh, great great work out there from an album standpoint. Uh, how did you kind of hold up when all this stuff kind of hit the fan last year? You know, the thing that helped me was being able to write it. And uh, I was down in West Palm Beach on March 13th, which was actually Friday the 13th, to do a gig I've done down there for 17 years, and it got canceled while we were there. And so by the time we got home two days later, everything had fallen apart for the whole year. So yeah. I just started writing, and that's kind of how I came up with Authentic. I was used to getting out and playing live and you know, writing with people, but you could do neither one. So I just started writing a record and I was lucky enough to go into soundstage. I mean, sound emporium and record mm -hmm. it with uh, John party's guys and some other people. And they were all wearing masks and staying six feet apart, but we, we had a great time and everybody was so emotional to be able to play again. You know, it was like late July, early August when we did it. And um, we got, I think 11 songs in one day because everybody was just so excited to be playing. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, so much of your stuff that I know of has been uh, collaborations. Did you write all of this alone through well, this whole COVID thing or what'd you do? I think there was probably eight of them that I wrote alone. One was a Garth thing that I, he and I had written with Mitch Rossell and I thought he was going to put it on his record. And I talked to him about it. And he said, well, my record's named Fun. I don't know if it's going to fit on that record. <laughs> so he said, why don't you do it? So I went ahead yeah. and did it. And then I wrote one a long time ago with Craig Wiseman that I put on there. And it oh, just yes. felt, uh, you know, when I wrote it with Craig, we actually wrote it because Garth was over at my house the day they bombed Oklahoma. Okay. And he just left immediately because his mama called and said they broke out the windows at her house eight miles away. And so right. we wanted to write this song called Faith Stronger Than Fear about these things that happen. And the sad part is they just keep happening. So yeah. 20 years later, I decided to put it on this record because it kind of fit the COVID thing. Right. And right. so and then one other one I wrote with uh, a guitar player that plays in my band now, Steve Allen, who was in a pop group called 2020. And um, we kind of met in a weird circumstance and um, started writing some songs together and playing in a band together. So there were, I think, three outside songs and then the rest uh, were, were things I'd written during the COVID. That's good stuff. I yeah. love it out there. Good piece of work. Authentic too. Let's talk about that title track, uh, Kent, because, uh, that's number two on the album there, but it's kind of uh, off the first one. Thanks to you, you kind of go down the list there. And I really feel like that's a, the proper song for an album, man, to kind of really, you know, take fans on a good ride through the rest of it. Uh, what was the idea with Authentic, I guess, the title track and the song itself? Well, it just, I was pretty much just kind of writing my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, from the time I was a little kid, I, my dad worked at IBM, you know, and was on the assembly line and, and he just, uh, had me work at IBM one summer and that was enough for me. I thought I can't, I couldn't do this my whole life. You know, I've got to do something else. And so that's what the authentic song is about. I never was one to fit in the nine to five or coat and tie. And uh, I was mostly a night owl my whole life playing in bands and playing in clubs and staying up late, writing songs. And then my wife says I'm Don Quixote 
because mm -hmm. I'm always charging windmills. And then other people call me Peter <laughs> Pan because, you know, when I'm playing with the rock band, I feel like I'm 25 years old. So <laughs> th that's how it all ended up in there. It just kind of came out one night. Right. That's good stuff. I love that one too. I'll tell you another one was uh, living in a dying town. It was also one on there that uh, caught my attention too. Was that, was that one of your favorites? Yeah. You know, um, when I go out and play gigs in different places, while you're doing sound check or when you're done and you're waiting to play, I usually talk to the local police and just kind of get a feeling on what their town's like. And I had flown in to do a gig in Ohio and we flew into Dayton and we drove up to a little place called Farmington, which was a great little town to play in. But when we were driving in, I noticed all these uh, freezer trucks out on the football field. So I asked the, uh, the cop that was kind of backstage security, what were all those freezer trucks? And he said, those are dead bodies. And I said, wow. you gotta be kidding me. He said, no, there's so many people dying of opioid poisoning in Dayton. They ship them up to here till mm -hmm. it thaws out in the springtime and we can go bury them somewhere. Wow. And so that's how that song came hmm. out. It's like, you know, I'm from Kentucky and that same thing's happening. And um, I've got a friend up in Illinois and I sent it to him and he's in Danville, Illinois. And he said, you, you just wrote my town. And wow. so, it's kind of sad, but true that that's where we're at in a lot of these little towns these days. Yeah. Man, what a story. Yeah. Wow. Amazing how songs come together, Jeff. I always say that here on the show. You never know the story behind them, too. Well, let's uh, let's play one here. Uh, Kent, no doubt, from the album Authentic. And I always say uh, dealer's choice, my friend. So whatever you would like to play for us here on the show. Why don't we do, um, why don't we start off with thanks to you? Because it's a real rocking kind of thing. That'll work. Let's do that one. All right. Ken, it's all yours, brother. It is all yours. Woohoo! <laughs> all right. Well, Jeff, I tell you what, I didn't have MP3s. We're not allowed to play those, but definitely, uh, we'll definitely. Ken, did you want to play that live for us here on the show? I could do that. All right, let's go. Let's go that rate. <laughs> Got to get the Facebook gods off of us, Jeff. No dings out there. We well, can't do that. Yeah, we need to talk to them about that. Well, you know, we uh, do. We do. That's a pretty rocking song. It's probably one of the most rocking things that mm -hmm. I've ever done. So um, I think instead I'll do one that I uh, I wrote with Garth. That's on there. How's that? Okay, that'll work. Please, here we go. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Let me tune this guitar up here. So we were, we were writing this song with Mitch Rossell, and um, while we were writing it, Garth and I were crying. We were writing it, and uh, it was just hitting home so much, and we played it for Tricia, and she started crying, and so I thought, we got a really good song here, and so I was hoping it would be on his record, but like I said, it wasn't, so I put it on mine. I don't think I'll make as much money as he would, but, you know, uh, it goes like this. Couldn't beat the red light that me staring at a homeless man. And credit cards in my pocket and the sign of the times in his hand. I always sat there and wondered why it was me on this side of the door. But then it hit me like thunder. I knew that man from somewhere before. Was he somebody from high school or someone that I knew from the road? Spent the whole morning thinking of every friend of everybody I know. On the way home that evening, had his name on the tip of my tongue. 2 a.m. I sat straight up in bed when it hit me where I knew it from. And that would be me without you. Every new day would be nothing new. I'd only have lonely to hold on to. That would be me without you. I 
saw a man on my TV. Oh, he looked like a regular Joe. But his story would lead me down a path that no good man should go. All his family kept asking, how could he do such an unthinkable crime? My guess is he lost his woman, and from there he went out of his mind. That would be me without you. Every new day would be nothing new. I'd only have a moment to hold on to. That would be me without you. You know he still brings her flowers as he sits there and talks all alone. I've seen him sit there for hours by himself in that garden stone. That would be me without you. Every new day would be nothing new. I'd only have lonely to hold on to. That would looking for one of the most beautiful and playable custom acoustics on the planet, look no further than Ed Rice at Toeir Guitars. Ed is a true artist, transforming exotic woods into magnificent, sweet-sounding instruments. Go to toeirguitars.us, that's T-O-I-R-G-U-I-T-A-R-S dot U-S, and contact Ed today. And back here on the show again with uh, Nashville recording artist, great songwriter Kent Blazy here. Me without you off the latest album out there, Authentic, which is a great album we were talking about here. Breaking down, Brandon Morrell, uh, Jeff McMahon. Yeah, if you don't have your guitar, check out Ed Rice over at Tour Guitars, and he will uh, set you up with a piece of equipment that you will not be disappointed with. I've seen them up and close and personal, and they're beautiful, beautiful instruments out there. Also, Bangtail Whiskey. Uh, good to have Ken here, too. I, I tell you, man, I love that song. love the way you performed it. And, uh, again, I can't say enough about how good this this album is um, uh, out there across all the digital platforms. I tell you, Ken, uh, one that also caught my attention off of there was uh, the song Rose. Uh, tell me how right. that came about. So um, we have some really good guitar shops here in Nashville, and one of them is Gruen Guitars. And I have a friend who works down there as a luthier. He's a, a great repair guy. And. He called me one day and he said, we're having a tent sale down there and you need to go look at this guitar down there. And um, it was a 1920 Martin with the roses paint on the front. And so I like guitars that have names or pictures or something on them. And so I ended up buying it and it was just basically in pieces. Mm -hmm. And he worked on it for three years to put it back together. Gruens was selling it just as junk, but... Um, so we got this guitar restored. Um, I started writing on it and a lot of the songs on Authentic came out of there. So that's why I decided I need to write a song about Rose. And so uh, she ended up being on the record and that was her picture on the front cover and the back cover. <laughs> and she brought, got brought back to life, you know, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah. And, and she, 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 he refers to her as she. <laughs> right, Rose. There you go. So let me, I, I want to ask this question. I want to ask it about the record, but, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of new artists, they always talk about, oh, well, this is who I grew up listening to. This was what I was doing. And I'm kind of curious um, who some of your influences were when, as you were kind of developing your artistry. I know, first of all, um, clearly the song Scotty Moore speaks a lot to, to the things that that you were paying attention to and a lot of people won't know who scotty moore is but right. also not only 
uh, you know, speaking to him as a guitar player. But when I listen to the songs and I think about the songwriting, um, we're probably the same age. I'm, I, I hear some old Mac Davis records sometimes in some of your songwriting. That may not be true, but I'd love to know kind of what, what crafted you a little bit. Well, you know, I was fortunate enough to grow up when AM radio was the big thing. Yeah. And so on AM radio, you could hear the Beatles and the Four Tops and Frank Sinatra and um, Motown. You know, it was so very Roger Miller. You could hear him, Tammy. Right. Burnett. So I, I just grew up loving all kinds of music. And then we were so fortunate to have some great TV shows like the Smothers Brothers show or Mac Davis show. You know, yeah. and Mac Davis, yeah, yeah. Uh, every end of the show he would just get up there and he would ask the audience to give him ideas for songs and he would make songs up right. on the spot and that was right. so inspiring to me as a young person that wanted to be a songwriter it's like look what he can do you know he can take anything anybody says and turns it into a song and i just thought that was genius and and it inspired me to really be able to see maybe a song in just about everything like rose or you know, many other things that I write about that are kind of strange that you wouldn't really write with another person on Music Row because they'd go, what what the hell are you talking about writing something like that? But right, um, it's just fun for me to not have any boundaries on what you can write. And that's because mm -hmm. I grew up on that kind of radio and TV thing where it was just all over the place. Yeah, Jim Stafford and Johnny yep. Cash and Glenn Campbell, all those, all those things, all those great shows, you know, mm -hmm. um, and Johnny Cash was not afraid to have Neil Young or Joni Mitchell or, you know, people like that on the show and step outside the boundary of country music. And he brought Bob Dylan to Nashville. So, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's just that merger of things. And then being a guitar player, of course, Scotty Moore was one that inspired me, but like, uh, I guess it's Merle Haggard's guitar player, Roy Nichols, uh, Buck Owens' guitar player, Don Rich. They kind of pulled me into a country thing that got me interested in country because I love the way that they played those Telecaster guitars. Right. So it kind of steered me into country music in a roundabout way because of guitar players. Sure. Well, and it's, you know, some of those, I, I'm trying to remember which song that I specifically thought, oh, he he had old Mac Davis records. It might have been um, "What I Am," maybe. Right. I don't, I don't know if that kind of had the little bit, play. but I love. I actually met him once and mentioned one of his songs because I learned how to play piano listening to some of those records, um, and came up with an album cut or something. But at the same time, those songs that that are those those big pivot moments. One of your big pivot moments was also one of mine. Um, when I moved to Nashville, Nashville, my very first show that I played from Nashville was the WIVK radio show in Knoxville, Tennessee. And Garth was the headliner. Right. This, this was in 91, which had to be a year on fire for you. Right. <laughs> um, because he played If Tomorrow Never Comes, which was his current single. Wow. He, he brought on Trisha Yearwood, uh, who had not released her first single yet. And if I remember correctly, she sang demos for you or something. Right. They both did. Right. And then I met, I made my first Nashville friend that day, who I have kept to this day, who is Billy Dean, oh, who Billy also Dean. sang demos for you. Yeah, he did. He, he was the first person that really sang demos for me. And in fact, it was kind of cool. We just did a a show in uh, Tallahassee for hospice and Billy came up and played it with me, which was, mm. you know, just kind of like a full circle thing coming back with him. I love that guy. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's great. So, so uh, can I ask you about if tomorrow never comes? Sure. I would, I would love to know that that came so early in your songwriting career. Right. What was, was there, I mean, obviously it's a great thing to have something that big, but was there, was there pressure to keep up with it or did it just kind of, you wrote it and you kind of left on, I'm sure today you would not feel that pressure, but early on, I don't know how much you had, that was kind of the biggest thing you had done at that time. Right. 
Well, I'd actually had the reason that um, I was asked to write with Garth even was I had had a top five record um, and nobody who'd had a top five or 10 record would write with Garth. And I was the only person that would. And but that top okay. five record okay. headed for a heartache by Gary Morris kind of. Oh, right, door, right, right. Yeah. For me to be able to write with him. And, right. you know, when we wrote If Tomorrow Never Comes, I had just met him one other time. I had no idea who he was, what he was. He was cleaning churches and selling boots. Uh, you know, he he uh, wanted to sing demos because he knew he could make more money. And so that's how we we got to know each other. And so the first song we wrote, which was If Tomorrow Never Comes, which blows my mind, uh, you know, we just wrote it and we thought, well, this is cool. We need to pitch it to somebody because he didn't have a record deal. And um, we pitched him around town for a year and we pitched that song around town for a year and nobody was interested. They said, nobody's going to sign somebody named Garth and get him played on the radio. <laughs> and you see a DJ going, that's Garth. So there you go. And uh, one night he got to do one song at the Bluebird and he sang If Tomorrow Never Comes. And uh, somebody from Capitol Records, Lynn Schultz, who passed on him for the third time that week, said, hey, maybe we missed something. Come back in. And he came back in, got a record deal, and that was his second single and his first number one. But it's, it's truly a miracle of which Nashville can do that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was pressure after that, but it was also so much fun to be working with him and Kim Williams and, um, and creating these songs and to have an outlet. You know, it was right. kind of a different thing from the other times of being in the trenches, being a songwriter and, and trying to get things going on. So it oh, was true. Yeah, it was there wasn't a a pressure till later on where he really had so little time to write that we were writing at five in the morning or six in the morning or faxing each other lyrics or you know, that kind of thing. Whereas right. we're like, well, I don't have any time, but let's see if we can write something. So that's kind of where the pressure got. But but up till then it was just more of a guys getting together and having fun, which how great is that? Sure, sure. You love what you do, Kent. We've said before on the show, you never work a day in your life. That's just one of those old that sayings. That's that... exactly right. And, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, what I am, that's basically, uh, you know, I would I would say I would see a lot of Mac Davis in that when you talk about that. And mm -hmm. um, just kind of writing my story like he would write some of his. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Lubbock in the rearview mirror, you know. and Sure. Lubbock just owned him and then. They had a big parade when he came back and was buried there. So there you go. Yeah. Well, and, and just the, the lyrical, some of the pictures you paint remind me of, and I don't even know if this was a hit for him. And I don't mean to be comparing you to, to him at any stretch. Hey, you, I mean, you're, you can compare me to Mac Davis. You're, all you <laughs> you're, you're great. And you're, you're great in your own right. But, but when I think of, of like some of the newer stuff now that doesn't really paint those images, they don't really paint those pictures in the same way that, that I feel like you do a lot with like lighthouse and, right. and, and he did with, uh, uh, whoever finds this, I love you. You remember that right. song? Oh, yeah. Um, it's just, uh, I, I miss that. And I, I love, I love the fact that you remind me of some of, some of those images and all that. It's awesome. Well, let's, let's just forget, Brandon, let's you and I talk the rest of the show. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, the, the songs I grew up with and the songs even like, you know, I hate to sound like a an old timer, but the songs in the 90s were so descriptive, like, you know, the song Remembers When or Walk Away Joe or, or yeah. Unanswered Prayers or things like that. And I do miss that in music these days. And that's what I'm aiming to do is take the listeners to a different place and paint a picture of something a little different or something they would have never thought about. Like I've had so many people come up and say, Hey, I didn't know who Scotty Moore was, but it made me go look him up. And you yeah, know, they're going, wow. He was like an unheralded uh, superstar. Right. Right. That's the, well, I love the record so much. And if you had got your uh, copy out there, you will too, no doubt. Well, I tell you, Kent, let's, let's play another one off the uh, record authentic out there too. And I'll have you perform one more. Let's do it. You got it. Hey, um, can I do a brand new one? That'll work. Let's do that. Out of, I just recorded <laughs> an acoustic album two weeks ago at Garth's studio of some new stuff I've been writing since the other stuff. Okay. But, <laughs> but uh, this is kind of a hopeful, you were talking about COVID being over and 
we wish it was but it's still mm -hmm. not and it's just kind of weird so this was kind of a song about that and uh hopefully to make people smile but also appreciate what what they have and what they had and what we're gonna have so it goes All like right. this it's gonna be the first song on the next record i think This is all over, and you can hug your mother, have a beer with your brother and your friends. When this is all over, over our shoulder, we'll get back to living again. When this is all over, I can talk to a waiter, not my refrigerator or change when this is all over you won't hear me say it's like the movie groundhog day everyone's the same and we can let that outside world come back in y'all come on in and be more grateful than we've ever been, than we've ever been, yeah. When this is all over, I can go hear live music, play electric guitar with my band. When this is all over, I can kiss a sister's cheek, be a stranger, and I can shake their hand. And I won't know every show that's on Netflix. I just might quit. And I won't let Amazon get my paycheck, my whole paycheck. Yeah. When this is all over, I won't have to ask where the hell I put my mask, because I won't care. This is all over, we can celebrate birthdays and holidays with anyone, anywhere. The world slowed down and the earth took a deep breath. I think it needed a rest. There were blue skies over Beijing. Let's not forget. Let's not forget, yeah. When this is all over, when this is all over, I can't wait till all of this is over. When this is all over, we'll add up the cost of the loved ones that we lost and send up a prayer. When this is all over, we'll bid these crazy times, a bittersweet goodbye for what we learned this year. When this is all over, when this is all over, I can't wait too long when this is over. When this is all over, when this is all over, I can't wait too long when this is over. The bangtail pour is comprised of a sweet corn mash base. The front has a subtle sweetness and not too sharp. It has notes of a medium char or white oak for a smoky flavor in the middle. And the tail has a super smooth and warm finish. Yeah, just like that voice of Kent Blazy there, you can get that bottle of whiskey sent to your door there. Bangtail whiskey, bangtail.com, or of course, uh, the Easy Liquor app. And I was just sitting here smiling, Jeff, and letting Jeff know about it. I was like, man, yeah, when this is all over, we can do all those things in synchronization and enjoy uh, life again, in fact. And I, I was just loving that song, so I can't wait to thank that you. That comes yeah, out. I've Good played stuff. it out a couple of times, and, you know, people are singing along with it by the end of it. Just they're oh, all sure. so ready to, to get out <laughs> yeah. and be living again. Sure, sure. No doubt. That's the, be the best part of it, too, man. I love it. It's, and look, you're getting ready for another live show coming up here. Uh, the 24th, we're going to be in uh, New Braunfels, Texas at Whitewater Amphitheater. Josh Ward and Randall King out there that night with the uh, backstage pass, of course. And definitely, if you had not got those tickets, uh, get them there because we'll be there with those two great Texas country artists here. 
Well, I got to ask you, Kent, before we jump into a little rapid fire here, uh, you know, Jeff kind of touched base on it too. So many great uh, artists are doing, you know, their things. And with the award shows uh, coming up here, I believe April the 18th is coming up for the uh, award show coming up again. You see so many great number of artists that so you mentioned uh, it with Garth, how he impacted the 90s. But there's a guy named Luke Combs that's impacted Nashville over the last six or seven years. And kind of going back to some of that traditional 90s country, um, you know, you look at Ashley McBride, I guess, you know, kind of looking at the industry now, would you say it's kind of very healthy right now with some of the artists are kind of bringing back that traditional country sound, Mo Pitney, we're seeing more of this. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of the young kids, you know, that I talk to, they miss the 90s country and, and Luke definitely has locked into that. You know, Garth said at the last award show, you know, he's going to be the guy who's going to be winning all the awards for a long time. And, and he just, I love his story. You know, he came out of nowhere. He's living in Knoxville, I think up in uh, upstairs apartment somewhere, had nothing going on. And, and it's another Nashville miracle. You know, it's just, uh, you never know what can happen in this town. That's what's so fun about it. <laughs> the beauty of that town. Jeff will tell me stories about it all the time. No doubt about it. Well, I love this. I uh, can't part of the program. We get into a little rapid fire. So you love this game and, uh, we got to have a little fun with it too. All right. So if, if, uh, Jeff and I say Kent's ordering a pizza from his favorite place and Jeff and I can't, have a slice for whatever reason, Kent. Uh, what toppings are you putting on your own pizza that Jeff and I can't have? Oh, I feel sorry for you to begin with that you can't, <laughs> but uh, there's a great place in Nashville that we love called Five Points. And uh, so oh, yeah. they have this thing called the Supreme, and it's, uh, you know, everything you could put on it. So I get everything on it but green peppers. And it's, <laughs> it's phenomenal, you know, sausage and pepperoni and mushrooms and olives and onions and yeah, I know you're getting hungry just thinking about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> you do. <laughs> we get up there next uh, year. We're going to try some of that good food there in, in Nashville. and definitely meet you in, in person and go out to have a little lunch or something or dinner out there, too. No doubt about it. All right, so when they, I guess the pandemic was uh, shortly after it or even now with it's still going on uh, and some people not staying at home as much, but uh, was there kind of a show that you had turned to, a television show or a series or something you kind of got into on, on TV? You know, um, Instead of TV, it seems like we were doing other things. But, you know, there's one, there's two or three that we got into. One was on Netflix called Father Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife's father was a preacher. So, of course, she could identify with that. And then there's another <laughs> one. She's from uh, Louisiana and Mississippi. There's a, a show of this young couple that lives in uh, a small town in Mississippi. And they fix up old historic homes that have kind of fallen apart. And, uh I think it's called Laurel, Mississippi, and the show's called Hometown. And it's just fun to see these people, like the young people I was talking about that would like to see the 90s country again. These people go in and and they restore these beautiful old homes that have fallen into rack and ruin, and they appreciate what had gone on before, you know, where in Nashville yeah. it seems like they're coming in and they're just tearing down everything, including okay. Music Row, and putting up condos and all that. So it's good to see people that appreciate the art that went into something and the, the talent and the tools that people were able to use to turn these things into amazing houses and then restore them to what they were before. Yeah, good thing too, no doubt. And I tell you what, I love this one too. We kind of pull out of the bag uh, from time to time. What's Kent Blazy's favorite vacation spot? Anywhere I can go right now. <laughs> <laughs> Five points. Five points. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 sit, I sit around and dream about all the places that uh, we could go. Um, I love the Florida beaches, you know, the white mm -hmm. beaches. But my favorite place in the world is a little town uh, called St. Paul de Vence in France. And oh, wow. I don't know if I lived there before when I was uh, in another life or what, but from the first time I was ever there, it just felt so special to me. So my wife and I went back three years ago and just spent a whole week there in this little town, which I don't know, it probably has 600 people that live there, but it's, it's an old <laughs> castle town, you know, up on the top of a hill. And it's like, I don't need to go anywhere else. I like that. got to get over there to Europe at, at some point and definitely tour a uh, beautiful country over there. All right. So it comes to Kent Blazy's favorite snack. Are we talking salt or sweetness? Either one's going to work. Um, I, I think in the pandemic, my favorite uh, salty one has become uh, the natural flavored white cheddar Cheetos. 
Oh, wow. I'll try those. They are really good. Um, yeah. And uh, you can eat a whole lot of them. They don't have a lot of calories like the other Cheetos, you know. Mm-hmm. And then um, sweets, I, I, I'll take any kind of sweet I can get, but um, I try not to keep them in the house anymore. But uh, Garth and I are really big peanut M&M fans and Reese's Cups. So <laughs> Two of my favorites, no doubt, when it comes to the – uh, sweet side of things. In fact, I think I'll stop at the convenience store, Jeff, probably once or twice a week and get those little packages of peanut M and M's. It's just something I end up doing there. Get, uh, well, yeah, girl Garth, with gas. You got to. Garth keeps a big, <laughs> big old uh, jar of them in the studio. You know, so it's like every time I'm down there, that's my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff to have. He's as authentic as it gets. So the album's called Authentic out there across all the digital platforms. Uh, Kent Blazy, the one, the only. Kent, we appreciate the time as always, and buddy. Uh, come back on the show anytime. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in person and looking forward to coming back on the show and we can talk about the next record. How's that? <laughs> Please. That's a Please. deal maker right there. We'll definitely do that, babe. All right, here we go again. Coming up tomorrow, don't forget Bonnie Tyler on the program to talk about the best is yet to come, one of her new albums. Uh, also, Stoney LaRue uh, dropping by next week for Texas Country and, of course, a whole lot more coming up here on the backstage pass in a couple of weeks. Uh, the great Neil McCoy is going to stop by here and talk about some of the projects he's working on here. So more to come here on the Backstage uh, backstage Pass. Thanks to Bangtail Whiskey and uh, Tour Guitars. Don't forget to go get the album when you're searching for good stuff out there. Put uh, Kent Blazy in the search engine and definitely get the album Authentic, which is out there across all the digital platforms. We'll talk to you tomorrow here on the Backstage Pass. You guys stay tuned for more. Take care. Thank you all. <laughs>